the release of more than 2,800 documents may or may not bring a sense of closure. We're going to discuss that and whether they further or answer the conspiracy theories with Steve Hendricks from the Washington Post. He's still going through them. But so far, according to our US correspondent Mary McCarthy, there isn't a document that's a single smoking gun. No, no. I mean, there's the the fact is there's just simply so much to dig through. It's incredible. What I find incredible about the release of this document is that everybody has access to them right in front of us. This isn't um, like, you know, 25 years ago when documents were released. It's we now have the Internet and we can sit in front of our computers and click on any of these 2,800 documents and see them actual photocopies of the handwriting of the parts that have been redacted, you know, crossed out with um, with black ink. And uh, obviously it was the evening time here in the U.S. when they were released. And I suspect many people will be staying up all night looking through these, seeing if they can finally solve the mystery of, of who assassinated JFK. It's extraordinary. I'm looking at the same material that you're looking at. It's a little bit like when the Panama Papers happened, right? Everyone is trying to find the secret. But, you know, so the, the old faded Imperial 66 typeset, I mean, s s this stuff is half a century old. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's even much more, um, you know, just the, the historical factor and the fact that um, the longer than something happened, the more theories there are floating around. It's much more sort of closer to the heart for, for Americans than even something like the, the Panama Papers, which was obviously a worldwide scandal. And as you as you look through them there, John, you'll see that there's um, sort of the, the first things people are pointing out is all the connections that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had both to Mexico, to Cuba, and to Russia. Things, much of them was already public knowledge, but sort of going into greater details, seeing the reaction sort of in real time that the USSR had to the assassination of the JFK. It's um, sort of like a bunch of Hollywood movies being released at once. Yeah. Is anything, though, actually proven in terms of a cause and effect relationship between either Cuba or the USA and Oswald? Um, and that's certainly not what I found. I'll, I'll call you back if I find anything. <laughs> um, call it's, it's, call it's, us first, Mary. <laughs> uh, it's interesting to look at the media here because people actually aren't really headlining on this because they think whether it's the New York Times or CNN or all the big U.S. media, they obviously want to be careful, go comb through things and sort of um, you know bring out the important things day by day, hour by hour. But there's no big headline here. And in fact, it's like a lot of things that we expect or are hoping for a smoking gun to um, to pop out as a big headline. The fact is that it, most of it probably won't be very controversial at all. Uh, I was looking at some things about how the USSR react, re reacted, and they were um, sort of alarmed by, you know, the instability that this assassination could create in the U.S. worldwide. So even though, of course, then at the time of the Cold War, they were uh, America's great enemy, they actually were hoping that, you know, there'd be some stability and that um, America would get through this transition. So it's actually just showing sort of, in fact, the goodwill behind um, the great powers at that time rather than any um, terrific, you know, unpredicted conspiracy or, or scandal. So maybe something will come out. We'll know certainly in the coming days and weeks. But the, for the, now, um, lot, lots of good reading, but, but no smoking gun. No, the broader context for our younger listeners is, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where, where the world really did teeter precariously on the brink of, of, of something unimaginably terrible. That was in 62. JFK's assassination is in 63. You can see why people want to join the dots wildly here, but you can also see that, in some sense, the Soviet Union by that stage had resiled somewhat from its position in 62, and it wasn't in their interest to have to deal with a new U.S. president, really, was it? Absolutely not. Um, in, in their reaction, they were sort of saying that they were hoping that there there wouldn't be some great new instability um, created. And then also saying that um, they did believe, however, that there was a group behind this, whether that was the vice president at the time um, who became president, Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson, or some other group. So it certainly wasn't in their interest to be going around assassinating U.S. presidents or pushing for that. Um, but they also did think that given the, um, obviously, the gravity of assassinating the U.S. president, that um, there might be another group involved. And then, of course, it brings us to today, where we have uh, certainly not the Cold War, but um, a, a different um, set of geopolitical tensions happening, many yeah, of them involving yeah. Um, the U.S. and Russia, questions of collusion, and we have diplomats being pulled from Moscow. 
Moscow, Havana, Washington, um, similar things happening all over the place. So it does make one sort of uh, question, you know, um, yeah, when, when all this really began and when it will really end, I guess. Uh, U.S. correspondent Mary McCarthy, later in the program we're going to talk to Steve Hendricks from the Washington Post who is going through the documents.